So this will be about one verse that gets brought up. 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23, so two verses, says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. There's many times in the Bible when so much is said in one verse that it is astounding, and this is definitely one of those times. And we don't want to miss any pieces of all that are very equally important pieces that are in that set of words. And God makes it very clear in the words above how he feels about obedience, but he also makes it very clear how he feels about disobedience and the consequences that follow. The verses on obedience make it, um, he makes a very clear statement that obedience is better than sacrifice. Though sometimes obedience may seem like sacrifice, the truth is that for us, most of the hard times that we go through are an outcome of us ignoring God's voice, often warning us how to avoid the hard times. And in the Old Testament, sacrifices were used as a covering for sin that one might be able to ask for forgiveness A sacrifice allowed for forgiving of sin and now obedience helps to prevent sin altogether. Therefore, it would have been better in this case where those two verses were spoken if Saul had simply been obedient to God's words, warnings, and commands from the beginning. And in this case, his rebellion cost him everything. God had promised him many things, and his rebellion, in this case, cost him everything, including his life. And it involved tremendous heartbreak, and he suffered a great deal from his sinful, rebellious choices. Health Psychology Consultancy writes, Many, if not all, rebels are psychologically driven by a false sense of superiority and wounded sense of powerlessness stemming from early childhood experiences. Their rebelliousness can be seen as a a compensatory mechanism. If you understand this, it can help you feel compassion for the rebel. So, rebels, and often bullies in general, are really of low self-worth on the inside and needing power. That's what that says. A psychiatric person is quoted as saying that. And that should help you to feel compassion for them, it says. And those who treat people the worst then often feel the worst about themselves. And it may not seem that way, but they are very disconnected from reality. And we can feel empathy for them, except that they will go lost forever, lost to hell forever, if someone does not intercept them in this behavior. Parents, you have a huge role to play if you have a child of this nature. Do not relinquish control to them. And as a parent, If you do have a child of this nature, which if the child does have this nature and you do get control of it, it can be a very powerful tool. But if you don't, they have a very terrible future ahead of them and they will leave a lot of victims in their wake. But do not relinquish control to them. Why is rebellion likened to witchcraft in the Bible? Witchcraft is at its core manipulation. All witches manipulate whether it is people, times, objects, situations, or outcomes. 
It therefore follows that someone who rebels is not in agreement with the flow of events as they are going and they want to or attempt to manipulate the outcome. They need it to go the way they want it to go. And how many of us have been guilty of that? How many of us are still tempted to do that? I told the ladies, I'm, I'm putting this together and I'm thinking, how many of us are like that? How many of us do this? We want things to go the way we want them to go. But according to the Bible, this is witchcraft when you start to force it to go the way you want it to go. How many of us are tempted to do that when we start to force it down the path that we need it to go? This is exactly what this verse is talking about. It's witchcraft when you do that, when you start to move in and start to force it down that lane. You're bowing to another God for power when you do that using the power of another kingdom when you have it you have a flow of events moving and you don't like the way that's going and you step in and you start turning that the other another way that you need it to go you start using the power of another kingdom you want something so badly that you go to the devil's camp to get the tools to take it that direction this is what we need to stop doing. And many of us have just made this a way of how we practice and how we operate. And I hate to say how common this is. This is practiced as much in ministry as it is in the world. Why is stubbornness likened to iniquity and idolatry? Because when someone wants what they want, no matter what it is, and they refuse to accept any deviation from their course, they will resort to even breaking the law that they might achieve their own end. They will go so far as to say, if God doesn't give me what I want, I will bow to another Lord because I will get what I want. An example that we see this often in is in the dating or the partnering world we see this all the time in coupling people date people they know are not passionately serving jesus but they want that person that person appeals to them in some way they have the right charisma they have this appearance that is just completely appealing to them but they know that person doesn't stand the sniff test of a passionate follower of Jesus, but there's still so much about them that is appealing to them. So they bow to another Lord so that they can get that person. They already know. They already know they've crossed over into the other camp. They go to the other camp just like Samson did. He went to the other camp too to get a person. Look where it took him. We know many that have done this. Most of us who are to the age that I am, and we've seen the wreckage, years and years of the wreckage of this. Most of us have done this many times. I can tell you from my own personal life, the wreckage of doing this and just the... Some of it has been a price that I wasn't prepared to pay personally. The heartbreak alone is devastating. The heartbreak is very real. Um, heartbreak often leads to addiction because it's so painful. You never grow up thinking you're going to become an addict. But when your heart is broken, that pain is so real and devastating a lot of people end up drinking and on meds because heartbreak is so painful. And that is because they were with someone that really wasn't someone they should have been with and um, compromised their life in ways that they, they weren't able to stay with them. 
it's hard to watch when we know very remarkable people and we see them in relationships that we know that's not going to last. We know it's going to cost them many, many things that are going to be quality, quality things about their life that are going to take out the best parts of them. It's very hard to watch. But then there's amazing stories too. I had a young man call me three nights ago. He said, I just need five minutes, Wendy, just five minutes, if you could call me. And he said, I just need some advice. And he had he had been living with a girl for two years, and this girl had kicked him out. And it was towards the beginning of the month. He had already paid rent. And he said, I just need your advice. He said, this has been a terrible relationship for at least the last year. It's just been a really verbally violent relationship. She is very verbally abusive to me. And he said, I just, I just want to know what should I do? He said, should I keep fighting for this relationship? And, and I didn't even have to tell him this, but I will say this to everyone else. If you're living with someone and you're not married, you're already in rebellion against God. So you cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and living with someone else. That is absolutely contrary to what is a believer in Jesus Christ. So he was not even, um, I didn't even have to answer that for him. He was not even asking that question, but I will say that to everyone else. If you are living with someone and you're not married to them, you don't need to call yourself a follower of Jesus or a Christian because it's not consistent. Um, you cannot be both. But this young man wanted to know if he needed to pursue this relationship. And I said, first of all, I said, I've, I've worked with men for many years. And I said, um, as much as I myself used to be one who despised men, I was one who despised men. I will be honest. I had been through a lot. I was not one who was brought up very respectful of men. And I, I am sorry about that. But I said, I will say that I have come to um, gain a lot of respect for men. I have great respect for men through what I have been taught. And I said, it's through men that I have gained a lot of healing for the things that have happened to me. It wasn't women that brought healing to me. It was men that brought healing to me for actually the violent assaults that um, happened to me from men. It was men who actually brought the healing into my life. And so I said, men are who God has created to lead women. Men are commanded to cherish women, to lead women, to honor women, Women are to respect men and to honor men. There is nowhere in the Bible that women are ever given permission to berate men, to, um, to ever disrespect men. Even if the man has done something, the woman is not given permission to berate the man, to disrespect the man. I told him I would walk away at that point. He said, she's demanding her rent back. I said, I, I, I would just, um, or she wanted some money back. I said, I would just give the money back. I said, I would just walk away at that point. I said, at the point that you give the money back and you say, bless you, I honor you, I, I'm sorry for every way that I've hurt you, just put a note under the door and say, I'm, I'm done. I bless you. I said at that point, she's going to want to talk and she's going to want to get back together. Just walk away. And it did go down exactly like that. At that point, she wanted instant reconciliation. Before she wanted him out, she wanted nothing more to do with him. But this young man walked away. He said, is that true? He said, I did not know that. He said, I've never had a woman treat me like that. I did not know that. No one had ever told him that he was to be honored and respected by women. He did not. He didn't know that. And he said he's actually going to hold out and he's going to wait 
because I told him God wants you to be honored by your wife. God wants you to not not um, put your hands on the woman before you marry her. He, if she'll cheat with you, she will cheat on you. Just don't touch her until you marry her and honor her. And I said she is to respect you and honor you. And that young man, he just, he walked away from it. And I'm just saying that to say that It is rebellion for women to dishonor men. It is rebellion for men to dishonor women. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, For rebellion is the sin of divination, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Proverbs 17, 11, an evil man seeks only rebellion and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord your God will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron around your neck until he has destroyed you. Deuteronomy 28, starting verse 1. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commands that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the, your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be the basket and your kneading bowl. And it just continues on and on. Matthew 5, 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. John fourteen fifteen. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John eight forty four. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Isaiah 65, 2. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, therefore he turned to be their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Isaiah 1, 19 and 20, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Psalm 107, 11, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the most high. Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Hebrews 3.12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Fall away means that you were with him. You have to be with him to fall away. Romans 8.7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Let's look at the word for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. 
Does God really look so strongly on the sin of rebellion as to compare it to witchcraft and why? There are times when we're deceived by the enemy and we make a mistake. We sin and God knows in our hearts that our heart's intent is really to follow him. We realize we've made a mistake, we repent, we turn, we stop sinning, we don't want to fall into rebellion. We run to the Father. We are grieved by our sin. The conviction stops us immediately. The difference here is that the disobedience was not intentional. There is a difference when disobedience is intentional or unintentional. If God has made himself clear to you, and you willingly then disobey, let's say that it was unintentional, and then he convicts you, and then you choose to continue though, however, in sin, you don't stop, and you continue, then you are moving into rebellion. Even though it was unintentional, you are convicted, and you say, I don't want to stop and you keep going. Now it becomes intentional sin. Now you are in rebellion. Your pride has taken over. You've chosen not to submit. You've chosen not to repent. You're staying in sin and now you're in rebellion. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. God hates rebellion. He compares it to witchcraft because what God is really trying to say here is that the root of rebellion is nothing more than willfully choosing to be led by another spirit, and it's not his. It's choosing to do the will and work of the enemy, and it's in direct opposition to that of his own. Stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. It's refusing correction. It's refusing repentance. And it's choosing to give your service, your obedience, and your allegiance to another God. I want to read that again. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. It's refusing correction, refusing repentance. And it's choosing to give your service, your obedience, and your allegiance to another God. And looking at this from God's point of view, you can see the severity of the sin of rebellion in the way God sees it. The last sentence addresses the consequences of rebellion and stubbornness against God's word and instructions. And this is heartbreaking because God withdrew himself from Saul in these words. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you have also, reject, you have also rejected, I have rejected you from being king. And these are very severe consequences. He um, rejected the word of the Lord. And just like Samson, it cost Saul everything and it eventually cost him his life and God can only use those whom he can trust to hear his voice but simply hearing is not enough we have to listen we must obey we must humble ourselves before him in genuine repentance when we have sinned we must always be seeking and walking closely to his voice this is required so that we will be able to walk in total obedience to his will rather than finding ourselves serving another spirit. Because when you are serving another spirit, you can lead masses of people astray. And we see many doing that today. And the problem with that is when you get into a high place and you are leading masses of people astray, the problem is, is that many of the sheep are asleep and they're allowing themselves to be led astray. It's incredibly devastating to the kingdom right now when you have someone following a different spirit, if it's a religious spirit especially, and the sheep are asleep. They're stubborn in a different way. They're stubbornly choosing to not hear. They're not even trying to find out if they're being led astray. They don't want to know because they don't really want to have to fight. They don't want to have to fight to know if this is the truth or not. They would rather know that they're not in a war 
They don't want to have to fight in a war that really requires something of them. So they want to sit under a leader that tells them everything's okay right now. I promise you everything is not okay right now. If you're sitting under a leader that is not telling you that you need to be fighting for something right now, that you need to be fighting for your children right now, that you need to be fighting for a whole lot more right now. It's alarming. It's alarming how many, how many churches are asleep right now. Stubbornness will cause you to lose more than you could have ever hoped to gain by using stubbornness to stay where you are and to find some kind of peace and safety under the stubbornness. If you think there was some kind of safety and some kind of quality of life under the stubbornness to just not hear and not have to join in the war, and I'm not talking any political war or any kind of a vaccine, no vaccine war. I'm talking there is a kingdom battle going on right now. God does not tolerate rebellion, which simply is willful disobedience to the voice of God, therefore causing you to willfully follow another voice that is not God. We are in some end times right now. There is a massive sifting going on right now. There are many people who have no idea where we're at right now in, in this, in the times. It's, it's frightening to me how many people have no idea. What's great about us um, having um, digital media is that we get to talk to people from all, all over and it's pretty much the same from all over that people are alarmed at at the sleepy church all over rebellion really is opposition to authority and it can be violent I think people think rebellion is violent but it can also remain unexpressed and I think a lot of the rebellion against God is is a silent rebellion it's just a it's a willful silence it is a refusal to enter in at this point it's a refusal to get close to the things of god it is a refusal to get involved in kingdom activity just a refusal to stand up for jesus christ a refusal to declare the word of god a refusal to fight for what matters to Jesus Christ. That's the kind of rebellion that we're seeing today. A refusal to fight for what Jesus Christ came to this earth and gave his life for. That's the kind of rebellion we're seeing today. It remains unexpressed. It is just, it is people walking with the name of Jesus Christ, they feel calling themselves Christians, but feeling that they can live a life of ease underneath that banner, living a comfortable life of ease at the expense of Jesus giving his life, they still feel it will cost them nothing at this point. At this point, that is not the case anymore. Rebellion always begins in the heart. And sometimes the silent rebellion is the worst. And at this point, that is the case. Rebellion against God's authority was humanity's first sin and continues to be our downfall. It definitely is bringing down America as we know it. For everyone who thinks this country is going to return to what it was, I'm hoping most of you see that is not the case. I still feel people are watching for that, but that is definitely not the case. Our sinful natures do not want to 
bow to another authority. They do not want to even bow to God. We want to be our own authority. And that rebellion in the human heart is the root of all evil. Everyone just wants to have their own great life. We want to have our own best life. We want to live in our own nice home on our nice street. And as long as our block is good and our job is nice, we're good. We just want, I'm keeping my TV off. I don't want to see all that. As long as my life looks good, I'm just going to, I don't want to hear about everything else that's going on. That's how I want everything to look. I don't want to hear about all the bad stuff going on for everyone else. That's not my war. I want to read a transcript called Changes Caused by Rebellion by Derek Prince. And now again, I want people to not think of rebellion as the kind of rebellion that hits people that are identified as my kind of people, the drug addicts and the alcoholics, because people tend to think of rebels as the kind of people that I hang around with. I want people to think of rebellion as many of those who are sitting in the church who look down on the kind of people that I tend to love most, which are addicts. Those who think they're better than others who tend to keep a great distance from the rest of us, who um, don't have love for the rest of humanity. This is something written by Derek Prince. Rebellion always separates the human personality from God. And separated from God, the spirit dies. So we understand the words of Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, writing to Christians about writing to Christians about their condition before they turned back to God in repentance and faith. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power in the air, of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Notice the root problem is disobedience. And as a result of disobedience and turning away from God, we are dead in trespasses and sins, not physically dead, but spiritually dead, cut off from the life of God. And Paul says the same again in, in very vivid language in Ephesians 4.18, talking about the unbelieving Gentiles. They, the Gentiles, are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. There are four words used there, all of which are so vivid and descriptive, darkened, separated, ignorant, and hardened. That's the condition of man. That's the condition of man in his rebellion, spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins, dead as a result of disobedience or rebellion. Let's look at the result of man's rebellion in the second element of his personality, the soul. I describe it this way. An inner force of rebellion became resident in man's soul. Or you could perhaps say it this way. Man's soul became infected with rebellion. Now the result of this is very succeeding. In, in every succeeding generation is that man no longer needs to be tempted from outside. There's an inner force of rebellion latent in his soul. You see, the first temptation came to man from outside from another source. We've already seen that phrase that Paul uses in Ephesians 2.2 2, where he speaks of sons of disobedience, those who were born out of a disobedient nature. Then in verse 3, that same chapter, he continues this way. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The word lust there indicates rebellious or perverted desires. So once man had turned against God in rebellion, there was the potential of lust of perverted evil desire in his soul. Temptation could come 
from within. And that's exactly what James says in his first epistle, verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, his inner lust, his own inner lust. The third element of man, the body, as a result of man's rebellion, became subject to corruption or decay and ultimate death. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. The poison of death was injected into man's body by his sin. And as a result, his body became subject to decay, corruption, and death. I'm going to paint a brief picture of the total result of rebellion in man's total personality. What was the end of a rebellion as it affected the whole personality of man? I could sum it up, I think, this way. Man's two lower elements, his soul and his body, united in rebellion against God's appointed inner ruler, the spirit. You see, God appointed the spirit to rule the soul and the soul to rule the body. But the soul and the body in rebellion through the temptation of Satan united against the rule of the spirit and as it were dethroned the spirit from its God appointed place of rulership in man's personality. After that, this rebellious combination of the soul and the body is described in the Bible by various very important phrases. There are three main phrases used in the New Testament, the flesh, the body, the body of sin. But when we read these phrases, we need to understand that they do not refer simply to man's physical body, but rather they refer to the nature that man has inherited through birth in his physical body. And the actual totality by what's described by the flesh or the body or the body of sin is not just the physical body, but it's that combination of soul and body in rebellion against God and against God's appointed inner ruler, the spirit. The distinctive word which describes the flesh in this sense is the word corrupt. Man has become corrupt. Inwardly, he's morally corrupt. Outwardly, he's physically corrupt. And the nature of corruption is such that it's progressive. So we see this in man's physical being. At first, corruption may not be obvious, but as the process goes on, as the years pass, the evidence of corruption is more plain in every area of the physical body. The same is true inwardly in the soul. Corruption is progressive. Unless the process is arrested, there's an ongoing deterioration of human personality. This human is, according to the Bible, has lost his hope of heaven unless he repents. I am determined to use my life for Jesus. And I never want to be afraid to tell the truth that many others are afraid to tell. And I know that Jesus stepped down to save me from hell when I could no longer save myself. And I am eternally devoted to him because he is very devoted to me. But that rattled my cage when I read that. (laughs) That really rattled my cage. Because that was so intense, I will copy and paste that into the comments because that was really intense. So I will paste and copy that for others to see again. But I want to pray. But I really want people to take seriously rebellion and stubbornness Rebellion and stubbornness is what this was about. Rebellion and stubbornness is what this was about. And we may think that's no big deal, but that's what this was about. Rebellion and stubbornness against God is what this was about. It's that big of a deal. 
And we can go through life thinking that's not a big deal, but it's that big of a deal. It would be that big of a deal in our marriage. It's a way bigger deal when it's the creator of the universe. Precious Lord, it's just super intense here right now. I really don't know even what to say at this moment, but I know that it's really intense here right now. And I just ask you to help me. I just ask you to help me. Just help me, Jesus, to honor you with my life. I just want to honor you with my life. I won't have to answer for anyone else when I meet you, but I will have to answer for you with my life. I do pray for every opportunity that you give me and every extra day that you give me that I will not waste my life, that I will never have an idol that is more important to me than you, Jesus, that I will not waste my life. I pray that you never let me waste my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.